Doki Doki Literature Club. If you thought it was all out on the table, you were wrong. When it comes to Doki Doki Literature Club, there's a lot of things that we can talk about. There's a lot of aspects that have already been talked about between us, game theory, and who knows how many other YouTube channels. But at the end of it all, there's one topic that no one has really touched on. A piece of the puzzle I'd like to address today. Between the twists and turns that Doki Doki Literature Club gives us, there are the ever-present issues that are happening to these girls. Which we, as gamers, completely neglect. Yuri, Sayori, Natsuki. We learn about what's happening in their lives through their poetry and dialogue. But because of the way the game is set up, their problems become background noise to the suspense and horror aspects of the experience. Who can focus on an abusive father when there's an AI out to kill you? Or love you to death? And honestly, it's understandable. Who wants to talk about hard and close to the heart topics when there's a crazy mystery to be solved? I can answer that! I do! For within these hallowed yandere school halls lies a deep pool of unresolved, therapy-inducing problems. Tragic stories told within these girls' lives that everybody has let fall by the wayside in lieu of the larger picture. Depression, abuse, self-harm. These are all things that people deal with on a daily basis that we've hardly talked about at all. We're focused on the game and the gameplay, on the story and the storyline, but not what is happening within the lives of the people that that are in the story. So today, let's talk about what we've all been guilty of passing up on, and together we'll find the message within it that we could all learn. Join me on a tale of sorrow, on a journey of understanding, on a life lesson that we can finally begin to actualize through the eyes of Sayori, Natsuki, and Yuri. Hit it. We're about to go where no one else was willing to go, to talk about things that really matter. But before we do, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Amino. If you don't know, Amino is a free app that powers more than a million different communities, and they're heavily into the indie horror genre. Amino lets you see posts about your favorite games and shows, like Doki Doki Literature Club, Five Nights at Freddy's, and Little Nightmares. I'd highly recommend checking out the Doki Doki Literature Club community on here. You can not only join an extremely active and super nice community, but find awesome fan art, videos, and anything else to fit your Doki Doki Needs. Also, we're on there, and we've enjoyed talking to all of you who messaged us from our last Doki Doki Literature Club video. So just click the link in the description, say hi, and join the amazing community on Amino. We'll see you there. Back to it. So here's how things are going to go down. We're going to start off talking about each of these girls individually. First Sayori, then Natsuki, and finally Yuri. I want to talk about them as if they were real people, because I can guarantee you that while you may not have the issues that these girls do, somebody who is watching this video does. And I want them to know that there is hope. There are people who understand. There are ways of processing what's happening to them so that they can get help. And for those of you who don't fall into the categories of being abused, being depressed, or inflicting self-harm, that doesn't mean this can't help you too. It just means this can be important for you to help others. So hopefully this video can act as a sort of guide to show people that they are going to be okay, and they're not alone. Plus, there's a message to be learned from the examples given in Doki Doki, a lesson that's good for all of us to know. I don't know about you, but I felt alone before. I felt like there was no one in my life I could talk to that could support me. Fortunately, Personally, I don't feel that way anymore, but I felt the need to put on a mask, a facade, to pretend like everything is alright when, in reality, my mind feels like a helpless mess shackled to my thoughts with no hope of ever escaping. I know what Sayori is feeling in these bitter moments when she finally breaks down in front of us and expresses her true feelings. Perhaps you do too. And maybe you don't know how to deal with them. So just like Sayori, it feels easier to keep them bottled up, worrying about how your emotions would affect others instead of focusing on what you needed in that moment. I understand those thoughts all too well. Those people that Sayori is worried about letting down, that she's worried will be hurt from her true emotions, they are willing to support her. That's what friends do. They support each other through hard times. Sayori waited too long to express how she really felt. She let her depression eat away at her mind for too long without the support and love of others. Of course, part of this effect was sped up due to Monica's tampering, but the reality of unchecked depression is still there. Sayori, in an effort to not hurt her friends, ended up bringing herself to suicidal thoughts. She needed help, and the first step was to reach out, a step she never took for years. 
As someone who has dealt with swirling chronic shitty thoughts in the past, both in myself and in others, I can clearly see the steps Sayori missed in dealing with hers. She let them fester, kept them secret, worried about others instead of herself. This issue of putting other people's perceived needs, not even needs they've actually expressed to Sayori, is inherently codependent. She feels that other people need her to be happy, that they are essentially incapable of happiness without her. And because of that, she must continue continually put on a happy face and never confide in her friends about what she truly feels. The desire to fix other people's problems is one that can unravel your life if you don't keep it in check. Are we essentially video game therapy here at Tree School now? I don't know. Regardless, it can be very rewarding to help and support others. But doing it as a detriment to your own mental health and putting your own needs second isn't good. And that's exactly what Sayori is doing. She's in a fragile state and refuses uses to put herself before others until it's too late. Chronic depression might stick around, but it can be controlled and stabilized with the proper help. Sayori was never in tune enough with what she needed. We can see her dismay in her writing, and these unaddressed issues led her down that dark but preventable path. Now that we've analyzed Sayori fully, let's go on to the much lighter topic of the abuse. Hooray! Let me just tell you, there aren't a lot of convenient places for jokes when talking about abuse and depression. I had this whole bit about Sayori getting hung up on others, but that's low-hanging fruit. It's dark humor, people. Anyway, let's talk about Natsuki. Natsuki has parental issues. Her mom is either dead or abandoned her, or doesn't live with her anymore. Her father is her primary guardian, and is likely an alcoholic douche nozzle who is either abusive or neglectful depending on whether he's home or not. As we've talked about in previous videos, we can see this come to light during Natsuki's writing, specifically in her Things I Like About Papa poem. By reading between the lines, it's very obvious that Natsuki is abused by her father when he is home, or just completely neglected, not given enough to eat, not cared for at all, when he isn't. While we did touch on this last time, we didn't go into the effects her father's actions have on Natsuki. With one or both parents having essentially abandoned her, Natsuki is likely dealing with a lot of trauma, self-esteem issues, and abandonment issues. When your parents essentially don't give a shit about you, it's quite easy to take that feeling to heart, to make it seem like they don't care about you because you aren't worth being cared about. This can be detrimental to Natsuki's self-esteem, and at the same time make it extremely hard for her to trust people. Hence her rather brash personality until we get to know her better. Natsuki's independence and rudeness is a mental line of defense. She doesn't know who can be trusted and who can't, because the two people she is supposed to be able to trust have failed her. Those feelings of being abandoned by her parents add on to her inability to trust people. It gives her the inherent idea that anyone who gets close to her may leave her and she'll be hurt by them. Which explains why even when we do get close to Natsuki, she will only put her guard down for a second before finding a way to break intimacy and close off from us. In some ways, this has made Natsuki independent, like her ability to cook. But this skill is essentially something she learned out of necessity. And judging by how good her homemade cupcake are, I'd gather she's been taking care of herself for a long time. So, is there hope to help Natsuki? Yes, but what she really needs is trust that isn't broken. And she needs to know that her parents aren't how people generally are. They're the outliers. Some parents mess their kids up by babying them too much, worrying about them too much, not letting them fail, or any number of other ways. However, Natsuki's parents really failed to be parents. She's never truly been cared for. By finding people who do care for her, she'll begin to mend. Of course, having a rampant AI breaking the game and killing people kinda throws more trust issues into the mix instead of less. But the main issue is that Natsuki has learned not to rely on anyone. So her problems are hers and hers alone. Her friends don't know, the school doesn't know. Nothing is changing in her life because she's been taught to close herself off from the world, to trust no one. And that lesson is going to plague her and keep her from changing her life, from speaking out from getting help. Now on to Yuri, who is likely going to be the most difficult to analyze despite how obvious her issues are. Yuri is a cutter, she harms herself. And while most of us know that this is something that people do, many of us don't understand why. It doesn't make logical sense to hurt yourself. 
right? It's not the same problem Sayori has, it's not depression. It's not an inability to feel joy or happiness. It's an entirely different beast altogether. It's a way for the person to get over difficult experiences. Cutting essentially is providing Yuri an escape from intense feelings and moments, even though it has the potential to literally kill her. It often starts as an impulse, just a way to release the pain of one feeling with another. Have you ever had an injury? Something that really hurt, like maybe you had a bad bruise on your arm or something? Or you just got a shot and it wouldn't stop stinging? A temporary way that pain can be relieved is by feeling pain somewhere else. The old joke goes that if you want to get rid of your nagging knee pain, just have your friend punch you in the stomach. Your mind can only handle information from so many different receptors. So when a new, intense feeling comes in, it lessens the feeling of others. I learned this firsthand when I sprained my ankle and it hurt all the time and then I got kicked in the balls. It stopped hurting for like five minutes. In Yuri's case, an intense emotion is triggering her desire to cut. So the first step is finding out what that trigger is, whether it's anger, emptiness, intense feelings about us, perhaps, and then learning to use other coping mechanisms when that trigger arises. The next step would be to ask for help. Tell someone what is going on so that Yuri would have some support and wouldn't be dealing with these feelings by herself. Therapists, school counselors, parents, friends, there's tons of people Yuri can count on to help her with this issue, but she keeps it to herself. And instead of working on fixing it, gives into her habit and continually reinforces that cutting is the only way for her to cope with what she's feeling. All these girls have their fair share of issues, but there's one overarching solution to all their problems. Ask for help. No one wants to believe they're in a place where they aren't in control of their lives but it happens. Talking to other people, letting other people know what's wrong, is often portrayed as a sign of weakness or as socially unacceptable. But that's not true. It's the best thing you can do for yourself and for the people who care about you. These three girls all had issues that, while overwhelming in their lives, had real solutions. The first step for all of them needed to be asking someone else for help, explaining what was happening, confiding in someone. And none but Sayori were able to, and Sayori didn't for years. That's really the lesson behind Doki Doki Literature Club. We all have problems, we all have issues, it's a part of life. But no matter how big or small they may be, the first step to fixing it is talking about it and getting it out in the open. Problems thrive in secrecy, but the more people who know about them, the more you create a support network that helps you with whatever might be going wrong. In my last Doki Doki video, I talked about how writing is an incredible outlet to express yourself and any issues you're having. That is no doubt true and empowering, but sometimes it's best to talk about things to a real-life homo sapien. Despite the fact they are just characters in a video game, the problems of the characters in Doki Doki represent things that happen to all of us. Don't be afraid to talk about what's wrong. Don't hide your issues. Make them known to the right people, address those issues, and get the support you need. And that's my take on the girls of Doki Doki Literature Club. You may have noticed I left out Monica, and th that's because her situation is a little different, and I felt she didn't quite fit with the rest of this video. However, if you would like to see a video on her, let me know in the comments down below, or download Amino and send me a message directly on there. We do respond to pretty much every message on Amino, so check it out and say hi if you haven't already. Also, starting Tuesday, March 27th, I'm gonna be streaming on Twitch. I'm Grant, if you didn't know that already, and every weekday starting at 3 p.m., I'm gonna be streaming with Ryan from The Real Truth. Also, Tyler will be there as well. Follow us at twitch.tv slash treesicle. I, I, I'd recommend it. <laughs> That's all I got for today. I'll see you in the next one. Bye, everyone!